Good afternoon. Wow, what a great audience. Yeah. So, I've flown all the way from London for this. Um, I wish it was on a hypersonic plane. It would be quicker. But we've got a long time to wait for that. You have a long time to wait for hypersonic planes, but we are working on them. Great. So, Making the world shorter is a good thing. Cl clearly, 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 clearly connecting us all. So I, I, I have this motto, London to New York in 90 minutes, so you can go there for lunch, is very much on our set of objectives. Be great for New Year's Eve. We can yes. celebrate it in different places. So I, I've got the great pleasure here talking today with Vinod Kosa, the preeminent and world-renowned moonshot investor. Moonshots, really, really important. We're going to talk about an AI utopia. We're going to talk about highly sustainable cities of the future. What do they look like? When will, we, wh wh when will we be living in them? What kind of intelligent infrastructure we need to support them? And I think we're going to view this through the lens of all the businesses that you've funded to get there. Um, but where do we start? Let's start with like, this high-level view of this future. Tell us about the city of the future. I don't know, 2040, 2050. What does it look like? Well, so the first thing you have to realize is cities evolve incrementally. They, you don't just design a new city. Occasionally, you can. Most cities evolve organically. How many people have read a book called Scale? It was out of the Santa Fe Institute, a few hands. I'd highly recommend reading that book if you want to understand how cities evolve and what's common between the, the the structure of a city and the structure of a tree, which is a natural biological system. It's a beautiful book, uh, one of my favorite books. Um, but one thing is true of cities. There's only one thing in a city that is totally fixed, and that's street width. So uh, I see Mark uh, sitting here in the front. We've talked about this a lot. Uh, if you have fixed widths because you're not going to tear down all the buildings on both sides of the street, not practical, how do you make a city function better? Uh, we know from many studies that lifestyle improves if everybody's commute distance is under 30 minutes. Now, of course, if you keep everything to under 30 minutes, in the current paradigm, housing prices go through the roof. So uh, the, the core function of a city is moving people through at the maximum throughput for any given length of street width. Street width. Uh, what we've sort of tried to define at a company called Glidewise is have the throughput of light rail in a bicycle width structure that can be in the bicycle lane or above the bicycle lane if, you, if, you're, not dealing, if you're dealing with too many intersections and all that. And you can do this quite simply in, um, uh, frankly, in prefab infrastructure so it doesn't take 20 years like the Boston Tunnel dig did. You can do it quickly. And then you get people to get through cities faster. And I believe the core thing to improve a city is improve public, infrastructure, public transit infrastructure. And I hate to call it public transit infrastructure uh, because if you use imagination, a new kind of infrastructure is possible. So what do we do to increase throughput in cities today, which is ass backwards, to be honest? Uh, you go from a bus to a double-decker bus to a light rail to a heavy rail. You make them bigger and bigger and bigger. Why? Because you need one driver to drive these things, and you want them to drag as many passengers along. Great for the driver or the public transit system economics if you pack these things with people. So many, many years ago, I did the following calculation. I took all of electric white light rail in all of the northeastern United States and said, how many passenger miles 
did we have on the system, of what was the carbon emissions on electric light rail or electric rail in northeastern United States. Turns out the average carbon emissions per passenger mile are the same as cars. We could call them electric, but they're feeding off a natural grid. And I was shocked. And so I've been thinking about this idea for a long time. Um, in thinking about the fact that cities are, uh, are fixed width streets. So you just have to increase the throughput a lot. And there's one way to increase throughput, which is to have things not stop at red lights or traffic lights, just keep going. There's one way to make it more convenient for people to use it, because the more you aggregate, the less people are likely to use it. You get off your restaurant job at 1 a.m. at night, you're, you want a car or a transit system there. Otherwise, you'll drive your car. And to meet that, it has to be on demand. It's kind of like analogous of your, uh, of your packet routing, isn't it? Back yes, in it the is. Day, in fact, packet exactly routing, passenger analogous routing. to packet routing in routing networks. Uh, George knows I worked on Juniper in the 1995, uh, 96 time frame one of the most successful investments we've ever made. We made about a 2,500x return on our investment. You don't need a lot of those. Uh, but it was the idea that packets should be routed individually, not as a bulk, which was the traditional teleco model. I won't go into that too much. Uh, but this idea sounds really exciting. If you can put light rail speed uh, or throughput into a bicycle lane width, if you can make it on demand, so more on demand than Uber, because Uber may take five or 10 minutes to show up. It shows up when you do. And these are small parts, so you get the privacy and security. If you're a woman getting off your job at 1 AM, you don't want it shared with a lot of other people. All that is possible if you imagine public transit differently. The other thing when it's not shared, is it goes, it doesn't stop for anyone else, which means it gets to its location faster. In fact, I believe it gets to its location faster than if you had a chauffeured car, because that would still be in traffic, would still stop at traffic lights. You get to wherever you're going faster, don't have to hassle with pack, uh, parking, it's on demand, so when you wanna go, it shows up. It's just a beautiful system, and that would decongest cities. But there's also a materiality to this, isn't there? Because we, we drive around in cars that weigh two tons to transport 70 kilos. So uh, I guess uh, in the future, all of that steel off the roads can be put to other uses. Yeah. So, and we can talk about cities more generally about this. About, I'm 69. When I turned 60, I started thinking of interesting problems to work on. Uh, and I took three months in a lot of hiking uh, and writing to write a 50-page document that's public called Reinventing Societal Infrastructure with Technology. And I just decided after that point for the next 25 years, I'd work on these set of problems. Um, by the way, nine years later, it's still 25 years health permitting. Uh, I'm an optimist. Um, but one of the points I made is we have to dematerialize the planet. If you look at the world today, seven or eight billion people now, almost eight, 10% of the planet roughly has a rich lifestyle in every way. And this winds back to the AI argu uh, uh, argument. So seven, 800 million people have a rich lifestyle. Rich in transportation, they have private cars, big cars, rich in education, rich in entertainment, rich in housing, rich in healthcare. So in all ways, if all eight billion people want it, can we have 10 times the amount of steel, 10 times the number of cars, 10 times the amount of cement? It's just 10 times the number of doctors, 10 times the number of teachers. It's not possible. That is not the right way to scale the planet. Yet we want to provide all 8 billion people with a rich lifestyle, 
akin to what the best and the richest 10 percent have in this broad sense of richness, not just income richness. Uh, that's the problem I worked on, and I'm very, very excited about. Redesigning cities is a big part of it. Now, what might this city happen? It's very clear today that an AI can have all the expertise of a doctor. And we're working on it. So having a physician costs you a dollar a month uh, because it's compute costs only for everybody. That'd be a city service or national service. Having a personal tutor for every child on the planet that's an AI tutor can pay way more attention than any physical tutor can. And my, works on, uh, my wife works on a nonprofit called Seeker 12 that is building AI tutors. And they map gaps in a kid's learning far better than a personal teacher can. And then they can tutor to the gaps in learning. So imagine all these services. And if your landlord is being a, a meanie, you get an AI lawyer to take him to court, because otherwise it's hard to access justice. So I imagine most expertise in AI systems, many of them so cheap, they're provided part of city services. Um, you'd never have to apply for something in a city uh, permit or a building permit. The AI would do that, and the AI would check your plan on what you want to do and see if it's compliant and dialogue with you, and you're done. I tweeted this uh, last week, like somebody should build this startup. Nobody's building it today, so anybody interested in uh, AI agents that eliminate the need for city bureaucracy would be awesome. But you can imagine these cities with, <laughs> with high throughput, with a new version of a transit system. Nobody would want to drive a car. If you can get there faster without a car, you don't have to worry about parking. It costs a fraction of what it does uh, today, either in public transit or in a private car or an Uber. Uh, why wouldn't you do it? You do it every single time. So I imagine that. Then what you do in cities, you have all these AI services, you have public transit for physical movement, you should build new housing differently. So we are looking at 3D printing housing or using low carbon cement, both strategies we're working on. And they are economic. They are economic because so much of the cost of housing is in labor and customization. Either you make them straight boxes and uninteresting places to live, not pleasant places, or you 3D print them where complexity comes for free. So uh, I'm, I'm meandering off, but I, I imagine a different kind of city, but it evolves there in bits and pieces. So you're, you're invested in lots of things, right? in the materiality, in, in making... But well, dematerializing the world is so important. I forget the number. There's a couple of tons of material every one of you uses every year. Uh, it's tens of tons. I forget the exact number. It just sounds ridiculous. Each one of you. Should we have a planet like that? No, we shouldn't. But... We've got time. And it's fun to work on challenging how, tasks. How do we get We've got one question up on the screen. Somebody put that question up before we got in the room. It's a question that I think you get asked quite a lot. So we've got this uh, future city. We've got this utopian ideal of services. But now we haven't got lawyers. We haven't got people working in the city. We don't have people driving us. Um, what are people doing? Right? You've of often spoken about this, about the redistribution of wealth that comes around this, and that's where the question comes in. You know, we're going to disrupt traditional economic models here, and I think that's a good thing, right? Disruption, mm -hmm. that's what you're all about. Yeah. Uh, um, but how does that work in, in terms of uh, income equality and so the redistribution? So let, let's talk about this. Every one of you has health care, which is whether you pay for it or your employer pays for it, there's a fairly large percentage of your monthly income. If physicians were free or near free, 
it's hugely deflationary on healthcare costs. In fact, we even have self-driving software for MRI machines and ultrasound machines. You know, much easier to do self-driving for MRI machines than for cars. And in, in in the throughput increases and the cost decreases. So AI will generally be deflationary when you're talking about things like services, which is a big part of our economy. Where does that lead us? It leads to, and I have a 2016 piece I did in Fortune magazine. It was a long piece, about 5,000 words, on AI will cause great abundance, great GDP growth, great productivity growth, almost everything economists measure. Any economists in the room? Uh, thank God. Uh, <laughs> but increasing income inequality. That's the first time I called for the need for universal basic income, but also the fact that if you do the math of changing GDP growth from 2% to 4% or 6%, and just two weekends ago, I, uh, I spent a weekend with a series, uh, a big e economics cohort of people interested in AI talking about how AI will redefine economic systems. Um, I would say to you, we will so accelerate GDP growth, much of what we think of as unaffordable will become, unaf uh, will become affordable, and we will allow for, um, for redistribution because of that. Uh, I would say a couple of other things. People have to realize capitalism is by permission of democracy. People vote to elect people, either on the socialist side or the capitalist side. And if a system isn't working for a lot of people, it'll be voted out. My personal view, Capitalism is the most economically efficient system, but we may move to where we optimize capitalism not just for economic efficiency, but also for equity. And I think that'll be the change we do, and that change will come from policy. You don't like forecasts and forecasters, um, but you, you make an awful lot of predictions, which you should do in a moonshot game. How long does this change take? Is this in the next decade, two decades? Is it dependent on where we are in the world? And if so, are there countries that will get there quicker than us because of you know, their lack of baggage? Well, so everybody has baggage of some sort. Every country does. Um, I worry. So. There's a lot of reasons this world I'm talking about may not happen. If the AMA prevents doctors, uh, AI from practicing, that'll slow things down. Right. Um, if people worried about job losses with robo robots, that'll slow things down. So one can learn to dis distribute these benefits more evenly. Or I'm afraid in countries like China, you can use Tiananmen Square tactics to affect change. Uh, this will be a social choice. It's a very hard set of dynamics to prove. But, but I do think uh, different company, countries will adapt it at different rates. Yeah, of course. And you mentioned China. And I worry about this. Yeah. How do you think the US is in terms of this? Or which cities are the ones that are get, get there? We're, we're here in Austin, I flew in, it's not a huge city. It looks like it could adopt all these things a lot quicker than other places I've been to. Uh, I, th I think it's, it's a cultural thing in cities. Uh, some, some cities are more progressive than others with respect, not in a political sense, but in a sense of adapting to change and adapting new ideas. Um, so it'll, it'll happen, but the nice thing is some cities will serve as role models for other cities. Uh, and, and some will be leaders, some will be followers, but uh, hard to predict who. 
Can I take us down the route of, uh, of technology? Uh, um, yeah, we, we mentioned Glideways. Uh, um, Mark's uh, here in the front row. He was just in a panel next door with some other people talking about uh, 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 a future with no traffic jams. Uh, um, you're, you're invested in robotics, in transportation, uh, um, in, in lots of different things. Uh, um, going into the technology that's needed for this, the intelligent infrastructures that are required for this, Going back, you know, to your, your history back there with Sun and Juniper, are, are we kind of like at a paradigm shift of technology? Is there more that's needed than we have now? Because it seems to me there's quite a lot of fragility around. So if we start laying, you know, overlaying all these technologies, you know, can what we have sustain this, or do we need to invest a lot more in the infrastructure? You know, every time you have a large change, especially a technology change, it changes assumptions. It solves some problems, but it creates others. And we have to acknowledge when it creates problems. You know, social media is an example. The debate around banning TikTok is one example of problems created by social media. You know, it is funny, we still debate whether we should ban it or not, but TikTok is banned in China. Uh, they have a very controlled version of that app in China. It's amazing, we see no press dialogue. So what runs in China is not TikTok. It's okay for the rest of the population. But within China, TikTok is much more about behavior, science, technology, the things they want to educate younger people on, not about videos. And uh, It has all that, but it's a different version of the app. And so we let them feed something different to our kids than they will to their own kids. Um, and then they argue it's not controlled by the Chinese. <laughs> so talking about China, you know, I, I, I was listening to a comment earlier that China has 3 million 5G nodes, yet there's only 100,000 deployed in the US. Um, so there's some catching up to do yeah. uh, from this infrastructure that's going to run yeah. our cities. Uh, you've often spoken about, you know, you don't like the institutional way of doing things. Is there a change that has to happen in order to promote this investment from an institutional level in, in, in the infrastructures that we need? Yeah, you know, markets drive infrastructure investment. And when the incumbents don't change, a new player will do it. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm less worried about that, but I do wanna go back to your original question. Change makes some things better, and makes, create some problems. And then the usual approach is you go address the problems. Uh, they always pop up. Mostly they're unanticipated. I don't think anybody anticipated 20 years ago the level of uh, issues with social media or that would, would endanger democracy. Uh, so, and AI agents may do the same. I call the biggest danger of AI is persuasive AI agents from bad nation states doing individual dialogue with our voters in 2024. Now, that's like a huge risk that I worry about. So there are dangers and we have to take care of them and handle them. So AI. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody in the room wants to talk about AI. You've been in a recent, uh, uh, you've, you've come from the back. I like the vision of a new kind of city. You like the vision of a new kind of city, but the new kind of city has new uh, And AI-based services for the city and right. services that people need made much more accessible. I want to give you an example. We just ran a study. We have a mental health company. Uh, and they provide mental health, mostly in the UK, uh, but they're just starting in the US. It's an AI-based therapist. Uh, in the NHS system, which is the only dominant health, health system in the UK, with the study of 100,000 patients, they found diversity and inclusion improved 25% by doing nothing, just letting the AI therapist be an AI therapist. That's pretty stunning. You know, we don't solve it by doing something special. 
and then other people resent that specialness. You do it by building systems that are objective. Well, in the UK, you've got a very different market, haven't you, with the National Health Service. Yeah. They need to find efficiencies because it costs too much. So AI but is But don't we want cheaper mental health here? No. Like, who doesn't want cheaper mental health here? Yeah, but the system sometimes is more difficult to work within, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm looking back, you, you mentioned the paper, um, the essay, Reinventing Societal Infrastructure with Technology, that you wrote mm -hmm. whilst hiking uh, back in 2018. Um, in it, you wrote about the tremendous power of AI, mm -hmm. right, that was going to change the world. And this was before you took a position in OpenAI with mm -hmm. Sam Altman and before everything that's happened over the last 18 months. Have your views of this tremendous power of AI radically changed in that time? Was it still that forecast is you know, the same? You know, uh, the thing with technology pretty far forward, you can, there's two ways of changing the world. One is extrapolate the past, and, and that's what most experts do. And then you don't achieve any radical change, you achieve incremental change, and we see incremental change in society all the time. Or you can invent the future you want, and then as an entrepreneur mostly, drive that change through. And Elon Musk did a great job with electric cars. I don't believe we'd be in the electric vehicle paradigm today if he hadn't driven it, almost gone bankrupt a couple of times, and if he had gone bankrupt, we wouldn't have electric cars. The traditional automakers would laugh at him and say, see what happens when you try and do something consumers don't want. Um, so my view is it depends on entrepreneurs to drive light, large change, whether it's to what, how you buy products or cities, public transit, it doesn't matter. Um, 2018 was the year we invested in both OpenAI when nobody thought AI was gonna be important, but also in fusion. We invested in Commonwealth fusion systems at the same time. And we looked at public transit roughly around the same time, saying what are all the things that are worth doing where there's a reasonable technical path to do? because some things are almost impossible. You know, if you t told me to eliminate cancer today, uh, I don't have a clear path in my head, though I have one I'm attempting for cancer also. Uh, and it's radically different. Uh, but you take these large risks, which means you increase dramatically the probability you fail. And it's okay if you're trying to change the world to fail. I don't mind a 10% chance, a 90% chance of failing if there's 10% chance of bringing fusion to the world, a new public transit, a new housing, a new AI. That's sort of the approach I take. And I think without that kind of an approach, we will not see large changes. And we won't solve the big problems. And when you make these large changes, there'll be side effects that you'll have to go back and mop up and fix, like we need to in social media today. Are you surprised by the speed? So, you know, OpenAI came, onto, came out with ChatGPT in November 2022, and actually there's this AI hype cycle that's going on. It's absolutely everywhere, and it's coming upon us very quickly. Is that hype? Is it real? Is it much quicker than you envisioned? Is it going to bring further innovations to us quicker? Uh, what has happened is, first, the progress on the algorithms was faster in their capability than people anticipated. What that has done is create a self-reinforcing cycle because a lot of very, very smart people now want to work on AI which will accelerate the rate of innovation. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. When the smartest people start working in an area, you'll see more progress in that area. Um, so I do think it'll move, keep moving very, very fast. People will over-expect things from it, 
in the short run, but long term, it's going to be much more impactful than most people believe even today. Okay. And there's a lot of talk about uh, 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 um, you know, the advancement of, uh, of general AI, and there's a lot of fear around that as well. Mm -hmm. Does that come even closer? Can you talk a bit about that? Because this, uh, you know, th th this general AI is going to be in this city of the future, right? Well, so let's talk about different kinds of fears. There's one kind of fear. Uh, could you produce an infinite amount of music, for example? Absolutely can. There's music models that do that, and I tell a fun story. I'm like probably in the 1%, bottom 1% of musical talent on the planet, personally. Uh, and my daughter got married last year, and I wrote down my thoughts. I entered into ChatGPT and said, turn it into rap lyrics. And then I entered into music AI, and it wrapped the music for me. Suddenly, I was able to rap uh, in a very personal setting with very personal thoughts. Uh, and that's a capability that would be beautiful to have. It's much better than Hallmark cards. Did you upload your own voice to it? Yeah. You haven't got a rap prepared for us today? No. OK. <laughs> uh, but I may have a second career. Uh, it was good <laughs> enough uh, if I need to. But it'll increase the amount of freedom people have to do things. But are, music, are labels worried about a lot proliferation of music? Yes. They are very worried about it. Do people want it? Absolutely. Why do I say that? Just go to Spotify and say, what percentage of this music streams are independent labels as opposed to major labels? It is up to 40 some percent now is indie labels or independent music, which tells me consumers want more of it, even without the AI. So many more musicians get a chance to be on Spotify and have their streams listened to. And I think AI will only dramatically enhance that. Uh, we have AI doing anime. That's pretty cool. Anime is so, so hard, frame by frame. Uh, people love it, but it's expensive. It becomes much more accessible. Uh, we have a book publisher that's AI-driven book publisher that's proven it can do books that have 10 times higher probability of achieving a certain level of success. People say, how much does this book produce in revenue? $100,000, a million dollars, more. Uh, it can do better than traditional book publishers. So all of media will change. And all of it for the benefit of the consumer. But there's a fear with the consumer, right? I'm just thinking that you know, there have been people. Like, so that's one kind of fear yeah. where artists might be fearful. I actually think the best artists will get much more creative, will leverage it much better, and many more people will be able to be creative. So that's one kind of fear. Or a doctor worried about, will my job go away? There's a different kind of fear, which is, will the sentient AI take off and hurt humanity. I don't, I, I don't say I don't worry about it. It's a possibility. But it's a small risk compared to much bigger basket of risks humanity faces. You know, an asteroid could hit us in the next year or decade or something that we don't know. We know that's happened before. We know China is the bigger risk. I worry about that as orders of magnitude bigger risk than sentient AI. So I look at the basket of risks and say we should appropriately allocate resources to addressing those risks. And sentient AI should be an area of funding at US universities and universities all over the world on how do we manage those systems. I do think there will be many ways to manage those systems. Um, so. You're a moonshotter, though, right? You're going all the way over there. But we're governed by people that don't have moonshot kind of like uh, uh, perspectives. I, I agree. There's, there's so many overwhelming... Well, what, one of the reasons this story has gotten so much play is because it makes for great press headlines. Whether they're true or not, 
They tie into our belief about science fiction, and it gets way more played than it should. Yeah, the, the benefits are overwhelming, as we've spoken about, right? So yeah. you have to balance things out. You have to balance benefits. You have to balance out the risks, like China interfering in our elections. Uh, that's a much bigger risk that I worry much more about. What about regulation? People talk about the regulation of AI, and I was coming over on the plane, and I'd read that uh, I, I, did, I scanned through a paper on the European-type regulations, which seemed very well balanced. But what's your view on that? You know, if we regulate too much, we don't know what we are regulating or what the capabilities are. We start regulating, we will kill innovation and we will kill most of the benefits and we will give our enemies a free hand. Just like TikTok, China has one version internally, they'll have a different version outside. So we can't lose the economic race and the race for state-of-the-art AI against somebody like China. No, I'm very focused on the geopolitical side of this and I think it's a real and maybe the biggest danger of AI. It's interesting. Uh, they've got intelligent infrastructure in China, but not necessarily access to the uh, microprocessors and things that we have in the US. How's that playing out at the moment? This, you know, Well, long term, they'll catch up. But if they're behind, we'll hopefully get better and better. Uh, technologically catching up in this kind of like world, isn't that quicker and quicker and quicker? Is catching up six months, it is. six years? It is. It's a real concern, uh, and some of the Western tendencies like open source increase China's ability to catch up. But back in the day, uh, and with some microsystems, you kind of like, you, you, you disrupted the technology scene at the time, right? And AI is new today. Uh, the internet was new back then, and you kind of like yep. bet on TCP IP, and you kind of like, Nobody believed in TCPIP for the public networks in 1996. Nobody. Cisco didn't. IBM Every didn't. major telco in the United States told me they would never use TCPIP. The internet is based on that. And you are part of a phenomenal company that took market share and grew, and then you yep. went on to Juniper and all of these things. How do you see that at the moment, you know, in AI first mover advantage that goes on? You know, at the moment, there's a lot going on with NVIDIA, AMDs coming on. How do you see that kind of like play out? Are you seeing lots of other exciting things happening out there as well from a technology perspective? In what areas? In microprocessors, in the network technology. You know, a lot areas. is being tried with microprocessors. Um, you know, what's called a GPU, and everybody now knows that phrase, is basically one or two simple functions. Multiplying efficiently and accumulating. So multiply and add uh, is the main function. And they've tuned these chips to mostly do this function and increase throughput of what are called multiply accumulate uh, functions. There are other ways to do it. We have an attempt at doing it in analog computing. May or may not work. I know some reasonable efforts to do it optically. You can compute optically too. It'd be a lot less power consumption. Uh, and hopefully you can manage that much more. Power creates a lot of problems, including heat and reliability and all that. So my view is, innovation will increase. There's two parts to AI hardware. One is training models, and the other is using the models, or what's called inferencing. Uh, I think inferencing will be much easier to address with alternative architectures. Um, and then we'll go to training. It'll be a comparative space in five years from now. Can we, you spoke about power there, and there's a lot in the press. I know about. we have a lot of questions, so I'll We've, let you. Yeah. yeah, we have, and we kind of like, we're going through some of them, I think. They're, okay. not, they're covered off. Um, let's quickly, just about uh, uh, um, power and energy. You're invested in, in, in fusion, in Commonwealth uh, fusion technologies. And when I looked, started looking on your website, all sorts and manners of things to do with energy from you know, generators and long-term batteries and this. Um, this we city do lots of fun stuff, lots. mostly break based on technology breakthroughs. 
Uh, the, but this city of the future is going to have to have like uh, abundant energy as well. Oh, absolutely. Where are we on, on that kind of like journey to get you know, to an energy? I'm now convinced uh, solar and wind are great um, up to a certain percentage of our power requirements. But you can have a bad month and, and no wind or no solar. Mm. So we have to have reliable power. I do believe fusion will be that source of power. Um, there's another source of power that isn't talked about mu much, which is super hot geothermal. I'm quite bullish about super hot geothermal, though most people don't talk about it as a power source. There's very few parts of the world where, if you, where you can't dig deep enough of a hole and not get free heat energy to produce steam to run, generate power. Uh, what's the problem? Uh, the problem has been when you drill to hot temperatures, drill bits just melt. You drill to four or 500 degrees, the drill bit doesn't work. You're talking about the, uh, in my school, Atlas, the picture of the volcano. Yep. With the magma coming up, that right. one, yeah, yeah. So uh, those, those are solvable technical problems, and there's many ways to approach them. Um, and we are attempting many of those. So it could be a source of power. One of my dreams is there's a coal plant that powers the Congress, that iconic building. And I want to drill right below it and produce enough steam to eliminate the coal coming in. It'd be like just such an illustrative, big, ambitious thing to try and get done. And then it can be repeated. In most of the Western United States, heat isn't that far deep. And so most of those plants, whether they're coal plants or natural gas plants, can be replaced by heat below the power plant. Of course, they already have the energy infrastructure there. Sounds like a simple idea. It just needs one big breakthrough in drilling. Are you invested in any companies? Oh, yeah. Yet? Absolutely. Okay, watch this space. So we have got, we've got a couple of questions up here, right? And some we've covered. Uh, um, we've got one here, uh, Figure, uh, a company released a video yesterday featuring their Figure One, which can have a full conversation with people. Are you going to have an AI assistant anytime soon, Vinod? Uh, so let me give you the history of robotics. So far, you build a robot for a purpose, and you program the robot to do one thing. Uh, and it does that well. Assembly, assemble cars on a GM assembly line, those kind of things. What the new effort in figure is one of those, uh, though it's a hardware play. There's a number of efforts that I'm very optimistic about. We said we took language, and we built a general learning model like GPT-4 or GPT-5 or chat GPT or Gemini. We took videos and we built models that can build Sora-like videos. In the physical world, if you collect enough data, you can build foundation models for robotics that aren't tied to a particular piece of hardware. You can run G chat GPT on any hardware, you're right? So, I think that'll become a very interesting area for development the next five years. And many people will attempt uh, what are called foundation models for robotics, which is foundation models for the embodied world, the physical world, because software hasn't gone into the physical world as much, uh, at least not in a general way. And these will be learning systems. So you take a robot trained to do one thing, put them in a completely different environment like the surface of the moon, and learn the environment and be able to do things. That's pretty exciting in robotics. Figure is one of the pieces of hardware uh, that people are building, and there's others, 1X and Halodi or others. Uh, every version of that hardware exists. There's a cool robot from China called Unitary, making them dirt cheap in China. Um, and they will collect the data that we need to train the foundation models. And 
this will be again a, a cycle of more robots, more data, more learning. The robots do better, they can do more things. So we'll see that cycle. It'll be an exciting cycle the next five or 10 years. But keep in mind, even a self-driving car is a robot in the physical world. We've been talking about self-driving cars for a long, long time. It's been the, uh, the, the pin-up poster, hasn't it, of technology. Uh, um, Brian, what you've been saying today, we're kind of like going to frog leap that, or where do we go next for self-driving? So uh, self-driving cars were done in a world which was highly orchestrated. And so they had to program a lot of things in. And some areas, you know, self-driving car can kill a person. You can't take the risk of it's okay to kill some people as long as we're learning to drive better. That doesn't quite work, at least not in the US. Though somebody in China told me, one of the leading AI guys told me, to win the self-driving car race, China will allow that. It's sort of sad, but that was a direct quote from somebody in the AI field. Um, and China is already the largest exporter of electric vehicles in the world now. Not an area they had any standing in uh, in the traditional internal combustion engine world. But uh, I, I do think robotics will be very interesting. They'll be learning systems. And when they learn enough, they'll get into homes. They might, you know, you, you already have a dumb robot like the Roomba vacuum but it'll be able to walk upstairs or you know, put dishes in the dishwasher. There was, I, actually, there was actually a robot. I thought they were gonna keep it for us. For the one o'clock session, there was a full stand-up robot yeah. here. Here's the difference. All these systems are really expensive and, and they can do certain tasks. When you produce in a high enough scale, uh, you, you get to much lower costs, much more data, and much more intelligence. So I, I was just actually coming up the elevator, and I said, you know, it's interesting to me that an elevator can cost as much as a car, though it's 5% of the complexity of a car. Why? Cars are produced in hundreds of millions of units, and one of my forecasts is in 25 years we'll have a billion bipedal robots. That's one of my forecasts. By the way, those will do more work than all of humanity does in physical labor today. Think about a world where that happens. But we have to get to scale to make them affordable. Yeah, we can build a hundred or $200,000 robot that does a few things in the home. And Sony's had this Ava robot that maybe is tens of thousands of dollars, but it does almost nothing. Uh, it has to make cost-effective sense in the world and do real things. It will happen in the home, but I think it'll happen in the home after it happens in business applications. We, we've got a, a, another question from the person who asked the first question, which is taking us into a different world, up into space. Mm -hmm. Is that something we could talk about? Where does space exploration intersect into a vision of an AI-driven utopia? Um, you, you know, so the nice thing, you know, we are investors in Rocket Lab, so a little company can democratize access to space. They made it really cheap per kilogram or per pound to go to space. SpaceX is now competing with them and dropping their prices for small loads. Space is getting a lot more accessible. Um, so there's, there's a lot you can do in space. In fact, we just had the first launch of, a, a, I don't know even what to call it, a manufacturing part that can make biologic drugs in space and we just proved we can re-enter and recover drugs made in space. That's pretty cool, uh, because you can do things that you can't do with, uh, in, on, in gravity, uh, in drug manufacturing. 
There are things you can do in communications like certain kinds of optical fiber can be much easier made in zero gravity than with much better properties. So coming back to data infrastructure. Uh, you know, if you're trying to go from New York to London with one cable, it's sort of a pain to put connectors at the bottom of the ocean. And so it'd be nice to have fiber, much higher quality fiber that can span much larger lengths and much more fiber. So there are many applications. Uh, AI in space, which is the specific question, uh, there are a few applications that need AI in space. And I was just talking to somebody, given the Houthi problem in, uh, off of Yemen, uh, why we couldn't monitor constantly that space. Turns out you, you need a lot of cameras. If you need a lot of cameras, you need to process a lot of data. It's best done on processes in space or on balloons as some way to monitor. I, I, I don't think it's a hard problem to monitor every square kilometer, every square meter of the ocean surface. And, and you know, this one set of people, the Houthis, are causing massive disruption in shipping. Enormous, yeah. Uh, we should be able to monitor it. We should be able to use AI in space to reduce the data and just say, hey, there's, there's something in there moving in that direction. That's all it needs to say. That data is very transmissible. Transmission from space is a scarce resource. And power in space is a scarce, uh, scarce resource. But it's possible solving that problem. I didn't know you were invested in rocket labs. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, we started when it was uh, five people or something small. I put a small investment in it just because it's got my name in it. So I just thought, you know, yeah. invest in things that say rocket. We, we have a rocket, uh, a satellite somewhere in space that says Coastal Ventures on the fairing. That's very cool. Yeah, it's sort of cool. Um, but that's an example. And then there's things to be done between space and here. We have the coolest weather balloon company, and the plan is to collect more weather data than all of the world's day weather data collection. Uh, and we can float 10,000 balloons over the planet and really predict data accuracy. They're already using AI techniques, not traditional weather modeling techniques which divides the atmosphere into grids and tries to compute in a brute force way. But using deep learning models they already have, with the balloons they have, the most accurate weather forecast in the world. When you listen to your weather forecast at night on the news or look it, look it up on Google, they have about three day accuracy that they have now extended to five or six days. But this will keep improving and they wanna 100x the number of balloons they have. So that's pretty cool. While they're doing that, they can monitor every aircraft in the air, anywhere, and maybe even every ship anywhere in the ocean. Like all these are possibilities. That, amazing and possibility. you know, we're working on all those, and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> There's what, we haven't got much time left. There's By the way, a lot more fun than playing golf. I'd be bored playing golf. <laughs> Oh, we've got one more question up that's come up here, uh, um, and it's interesting and, and probably more prescient right now. Somebody's asked, what's the future of AI and decision sciences, and how will an AI CEO look like? Will you be working with AI founders anytime soon? You know, somebody has attempted to do that. Uh, look, the general rule should be anything humans can do, AI will be able to do better. The question is how much agency, and this is not a technical question. This is a social question. Societies want a hand to AI, and I believe that's a choice we will make. And we will keep making it and keep changing it as we learn more and get more comfort. But there isn't one specific answer. Well, we've got to trust in the future, haven't we? Yes. Vinod, as a last parting comment, uh, um, where do you think we'll be in the next few years? 
how quickly is this rolling out? Just leave us with that sound bit, and then we can get on out and walk into the You know, the surprising the thing is, I think we'll see a lot of progress, and some amount of busting of the hype of AI. AI will underperform in the next three years. It will overperform in the next 10 years compared to what we expect today. And we should keep that in mind. It's just the nature of human beings to get too excited, get on bandwagons, uh, and, and te real technology and real applications take time. That's a really great place uh, uh, to end this. Um, Vinod Costa, thank you very much for sharing so much. Thank you, everybody.